Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal, and we are joined today by Professor Vanessa M. Holden, Associate Professor of History and African American and Africana Studies at the University of Kentucky and Director of the Central Kentucky Slavery Initiative. She is the author of the just published Surviving Southampton, African American Women and Resistance in Nat Turner's Community, University of Illinois Press, July 2021, of which uh, noted historian Erica Armstrong Dunbar writes, very few scholarly texts for readers to completely reimagine iconic events. In Surviving Southampton, Vanessa Holden introduces her readers to an understudied cast of characters involved in the most infamous slave rebellion of the 19th century, refashioning a well-known segment of history. This book is required reading for anyone interested in the study of enslaved resistance. What's up, Vanessa? How are you doing? Um, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Uh, Trying to stay warm uh, this winter, (laughs) all that good stuff. Uh, Trying to, you know, navigate the Zoomiverse for the season three, (laughs) season three of the pandemic. I, I was struck early in the book, you talk about the germ of this book. Um, you at a young age, just wandering aloud. Um, how, how the hell did Nat Turner survive all those months, it, it survive escaping? Um, and, and it struck me on a couple of levels, right? Because, you know, to the extent that you were young enough and even knew who Nat Turner was, <laughs> to then, you know, as an aside, ask that question, well, well, how did he do this for so many? Talk, talk about your introduction to, you know, what we call the Nat Turner Rebellion, uh, but, you know, as you reframe throughout the book is, is really the Southampton Rebellion. Uh, talk about your relationship with, with Mr. Turner. Sure. I mean, you know, growing up, going to uh, American public schools, <laughs> I saw this, uh, it's a, I think it's a woodcut that purports to be Nat Turner sort of menacingly mm-hmm. in a swamp plotting with other <laughs> enslaved men. It's actually an illustration from Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel, Dread of the Great Dismal Swamp, sort of loosely based on mm-hmm. white anxieties about Nat Turner. It's not even really depicting him. So like most people, I'd, I'd heard the name Nat Turner and I, I knew that there was a rebellion, but that's really where Mm -hmm. my knowledge stopped and that's where people's teaching stopped and nobody was really interested in talking about (laughs) someone who managed to lead a rebellion that led to the deaths of almost you know 60 white men women and children um i got to college and like a lot of undergraduates i read the confessions of nat turner Mm -hmm. uh the uh, historical document not the william styron novel but the historical document um i you know, sat through a a lecture about (laughs) enslaved people. And, you know, as as a black woman myself, it made no sense to me that somehow a small group of black men launched America's most famous slave rebellion. And somehow no black women knew anything about it. And were completely in the dark that anything was how it just didn't make any sense you know on a on a kind of <laughs> gut level that that was even possible um and when i got to the part you know he talks in his confessions about hiding out in these dugout caves mm-hmm. actually pretty close to where he was enslaved and i thought you know this man he talks a little bit about being able to steal food but he's the most wanted man in virginia he's the most wanted man in america he can't just you know, take the Run into somebody's he could, yeah, kitchen, he could right. once take. <laughs> and so in my head, I was like, how is he eating? And this man is missing from the end of August through the end of October, 1830. How is he eating, right? He's not living on the roots and berries of the forest at that time of year in the swamps of Southampton. <laughs> um, and I thought, you know, okay, I get it. He's he's silent about this for obvious reasons uh, in this uh, in this confession. He doesn't name a single person in that confession who wasn't already uh, in jail, uh, convicted. Some had already been executed, right? So he's not naming new names. 
Uh, and I, you know, I went down this path. And as I graduated college, uh, Stephanie Camp's book about women and everyday resistance came out. And what one of the things that, that her book opened up for me was the ways that African American women were integral to the sort of daily mm -hmm. practice of resistance, that mm -hmm. Black culture is resistive culture, that there are daily practices that range from basic survival, you know, basic mm -hmm. survival right. considerations right. all the way to, all right, we're burning this barn down. All right, we're going to help hide this person who just showed up at my cabin door. All right, that's it. Our only option is to go to the swamps. Um, and I said, you know, if women are, are that embedded in what is happening every day to resist slavery, there's no way that men who launch a slave rebellion aren't counting on that. You know, they're, they're not already familiar with that network and right. they're not counting on it. Right. Expecting um, it, right. Expecting it, right? right? And so when I started looking for women, surprise, surprise, uh, Black women are the majority of women in Southampton. They are the women of Southampton County. They're everywhere, surprise, surprise. Uh, and they're everywhere that the rebellion touches. Um, so, you know, what started as this kind of hunch from my own my own knowledge of the, the women who raised me on both sides of my family, uh, the ways that Black women are integral to community survival in the contemporary period, this kind of hunch that this man is not out in the swamps eating. <laughs> he can't cook, he can't light a fire, right? Like, like there's just some practical considerations. Right. You know, he can't light a fire if he's hiding out. That doesn't make any sense. Um, right. That, you know, oh, look, and his cave is like not so far from where his wife was probably enslaved. Uh, okay, you're right. I, I'm not going to find the smoking gun document that says it was these women right. who were feeding him, right. but right. I can find all these other things around it. And one of the things you talk about is that when we think about th this history of resistance and rebellion, we tend to think about, you know, Black men as rebellious and in revolt right and, and black women simply in in this kind of resistance and you kind of trouble that notion right you know to think about resistance as a form of rebellion and and revolt and talk a little bit about those gendered expectations that we've historically had about you know when black folks are in insurrection yeah i mean and that's uh it kind of goes back to these initial hunches you know my first introduction to women's history as a field was in college that's true for mm -hmm. most people uh and another thing that really just didn't make a whole lot of sense to me um is that you know only men had a stake in violent yeah. rebellion black women under slavery overwhelmingly did exactly the same labor as men, um, were expected to meet the same quotas in the fields as men. So how is it that on the one hand, enslavers see Black women as, at least in a laboring capacity, the equals of mm -hmm. men, but then when it comes to slave rebellion, suddenly women are, are too delicate to have been involved um, or too, you know, they're not, they would never be violent. Certainly women would never be violent. Um, and I thought, you know, this, this also doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, it doesn't, that doesn't really work out. Let me look into what these women are doing day to day on these farms, what they're doing day to day to connect laboring spaces. Um, and it, it turns out uh, that some of the ways that enslavers really erase women's contributions yeah. have way more to do with their investment in slavery as a system than the reality of Black women's capabilities. Um, and it's true as far as we know, uh, Nat Turner and only a small group of men met over the course of 1831 to plot a violent revolt. Um, but we don't we don't know uh, who else they were counting on when they mm -hmm. arrived mm -hmm. at individual farms and plantations. Um, and women, uh, you know, they get this. Enslaved women are often seen as the less mobile gender mm -hmm. that black mm -hmm. men, 
sometimes, not really in Southampton County, but sometimes they had trades open to them. They were wagoners, they were watermen in Virginia, that travel and movement for black men was way more possible and not really for women. But it turns out within these small farms and plantations, black women were often filling labor gaps where they were needed. So they're working in the kitchen, but if they need to bring in the harvest, they're out there. So there's a work reason, work related reason for them to be just about anywhere that men, there's no reason for them to be in a plantation yard during the day. They need, there's one place they should be. So it, it came together for me, you know, successful military operations have, they must have, they must have a functioning supply line and an intelligence network. They have to have those things or they cannot succeed. They might, a charge might succeed, but that's about it. And I said, here it is. Women are working in these central hubs of information. They don't need to be out in the woods, right? They need to be in the positions where they have the most access. I mean, that that kind of cracked that open uh, for me that, ooh, these are actually like companionate uh, sort of like spectrums of resistance and rebellion. And women are playing these particular roles and passing on significant information that men must have or they're yeah. not going to be successful. You know, you mentioned the intelligence piece. And, that, and that's one of the things that struck me, you know, reading through the book, uh, the duality of Black women's experiences in that they knew the built environment of the kitchen, right, uh, of, of the backyard, of the grounds before the house, all these kinds of things. But because they also worked in the fields, they also understood to the natural environment, right? So they had a sense of both intelligence about all these kind of environments that men didn't have, right? And, and you know, you tell the story of the, the the planter who's trying to protect his house and keep focus out and get his wife out. And, and, and you know, the Black woman is waiting in the kitchen for her, right? You oh, yeah. know, because, because she knew where she could hide, right? You know, in that particular space that even the husband right, the, uh, the planter, the owner wouldn't have known, right, those kinds of, that kind of intelligence. Yeah, I mean, she knew that space between the kitchen and the back, like, she knew that space very well, because she probably traveled it all the time, right, 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 and if that woman was going to escape, that's her escape route, and <laughs> Lucy was there to catch her, right, but there's another enslaved person who comes along, and I, you know, this image of this kind of tug of war with this female enslaver is really vivid in my mind, Right, because the the sort of motivation of the person, the enslaver who's trying to pull this woman away to safety, um, you know, if she had it won out in that tug of war, Lucy probably wouldn't have been the only woman executed. Uh, right. She probably would have would have lived. Uh, right. And there's that too. That there are a number of places that we we cannot know, at least in the in the bounds of the discipline of history, we we can't know with those methods. Right. how directly involved many women were. Um, we just have sort of, you know, dead bodies on the kitchen floor that this woman's <laughs> stepping over <laughs> to cook dinner. We got to just kind of <laughs> gotta go with it while she's testifying about it. Talk a little bit about Southampton. What was it about Southampton as a region, um, as a natural environment that really creates the context for this rebellion? So Southampton County, it's right on the border with North Carolina. Uh, it's an area of Virginia called the South Side because it's south mm-hmm. of the James River. Uh, it has a river, the Nottoway River, that's named for the indigenous people who originally inhabited the area that cuts through it. Um, and it's also pretty unique in Virginia because it, it sits atop this soil band that actually wraps through some of the most fertile cotton land in the deep south up through Georgia and the Carolinas. And there's just a teeny tiny bit of this sandy loam that is in Virginia. And it basically is in the southern side of Southampton County. It's one of the few places in Virginia that's growing and producing short staple upland cotton. Um, That's not a Virginia crop, typically. Uh, So Southampton County, you know, it it is, in fact, uh, you know, losing enslaved, uh, particularly adolescents, into the internal slave trade. At the same time, that it kind of has a taste of this cotton South slavery version of slavery that's booming um, in the 1830s. And there's a way that Southampton County, for a lot of Southerners, just feels like an every South. 
because so Oof. much of the South in the 1830s looks a lot like Southampton County, that it's it's not yet giant plantations. It's actually small to medium sized farms, mm -hmm. a few people who own a lot of land and a lot of enslaved people. The, the white people on the south side of the county, um, many of them are related to each other. Uh, and the historian uh, David of Almendinger does a lot of tracing their property records and the ways that they're really using enslaved families as financial products to kind of, they're actually just moving it, the same enslaved families in between small parcels of land to kind of bolster their family's right. prospects. Right. So African-Americans are acutely experiencing in the county a huge shift that for Virginia, a lot of Virginia counties are just experiencing an outflow of enslaved mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. but, but they are experiencing in the 1830s, the shift to, to using enslaved people pretty blatantly as financial products. They are very aware that slavery is here to stay. It is not dying out and that these white families are gonna use it um and use them as movable property not just farm labor uh the other thing about southampton county is that it sort of borders what was then nansemon county that county doesn't exist anymore but that's where the great dismal swamp is and there had been a, a much longer tradition of marinage in the great dismal swamp um wpa narratives taken down in the 1930s from that area of Virginia talk about the swamp people and right. sort, of sort of tenuous connections to folks who uh, now we have archaeological evidence really did create right. whole communities right. deep in the swamp. Um, there's also an indigenous presence in Southampton County. Uh, their descendant communities now now prefer the name either Nottaway or Chernahaka Nottaway. I leave it to them to decide how they'd like to be referred to, but um, there is a parcel of Indian land that uh, free people of color, who at the time were also indigenous, um, that right. term covered both people of African descent, and they were there. So there's sort of this interesting uh, mix of a bunch of kinds of Souths in mm -hmm. Southampton mm -hmm. that allow for a just enough isolation, right? for people to think that oh maybe we're 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 not like richmond we're not like portsmouth we're we're not prey to these outside influences just swampy enough for there to be good hiding places mm -hmm. just enough cotton land for enough families to be rooted in the region because folks are less likely to sell if they think they can make cotton money right so it's sort of this kind of perfect storm and a lot of white southerners in other regions realize just how much this actually just looks like where they live. Um, and that's probably the more terrifying part that this really could just be anywhere. Um, and it's just far enough that the state militia isn't gonna get to you. You know, you, yeah. the, the, white, yeah. the white power hierarchy might win, but a lot of people got got before, yeah. before the militia showed up, right? So there's that, that piece of it too. You talk about how, you know, early in the history of Southampton County, it, there's less of a concern about slave rebellion and slave revolt, much more concerned with indentured servitudes, you know, taking off, much more concerned about uh, uh, being attacked by Native populations, Indigenous populations in that region. And, and it's really not until this period that you talked to talk about just a moment ago, um, where the real value of the enslaved population, you know, comes to bear to the point that they want to constrain and control them, you know, in ways that were almost a second thought, you know, you know, prior to that point in time, you begin the book talking about these geographies of surveillance and control. Talk a little bit about how these ge geographies map onto this new economic reality, you know, in, in the early 19th century. I mean, throughout the book, I, I use place as a source. Um, and I, you know, Southampton County is an older county in Virginia. Uh, it's very much uh, relate the people who incur on native lands initially are very related to those early generations of Europeans yeah. in in Virginia, and they bring with them um, a, a sense that, you know, this whole tobacco economy thing could go either way. And it doesn't necessarily make sense to constrain black people's mobility. Um, by the late 18th century, 
uh, especially after the American Revolution, right? What was once the frontier in Virginia is is now, you know, solidly in the middle of the right. state. Uh, and and they're much more concerned about hanging on to valuable human property. Interestingly, a visage of that indigenous servitude sticks around in free people of colors, uh, labor regimes that, that they end up often on year long labor contracts and then black free black children are indentured uh, often to white landowners. So they're still engaging in some ways in this kind of hybrid system where they can afford to hold a few enslaved people, but then they'll kind of supplement that labor with free labor. Um, and there's a, a sort of a cat and mouse game here, right? Where they're gonna continue to send out patrols and black people are gonna continue to evade patrols and meet outside of working hours anyway. And everybody kind of knows <laughs> that that's, it's not possible to always I, I, control every movement, right? And it's not even, as I point out in the book, really that hard to know when patrols are gonna go out. It's not actually that hard to thwart them. Um, so these geographies are really about the working day yeah. and then the same spaces, right? That during the working day are sites of labor, are sites of uh, abuse and violence, right? Can also be sites right. of resistance at the exact same time sometimes, um, are sites of community making, home, intimacy, uh, deep you know deep love for black children um i talk a lot about kitchens as these nerve centers of these households and you know i, I use an example of uh one wpa and to remembering from her childhood her mother just straight up talking to a coachman about when the patrols were going out yeah. next to her white enslaver because they spoke in code <laughs> you know like as a kid right like so this white woman is like surveilling her work and making sure she finishes and telling her the best way to you know cut the pie crust or whatever um at the same time that she's now got information you know right there right next right, to her right, their wheels right, in the right. wheat you know now i can tell people hey if you do decide to go out tonight just so you know they're right. going to ride out, right? So I do a lot of thinking about, right, space it, these spaces that are supposed to be so tightly controlled and the ways that Black people tell us they're always thwarting, right? They're always right, right, lowering, right. yeah, resistance in those spaces. Let me ask you a, a philosophical question about choosing this study, this the Southampton Rebellion, you know, I find there's a way that in, in the mainstream of Black thought, if you will, particularly in, the, 20, in the, the mid to late 20th century, with so much of an investment on nonviolent resistance, right? And, and, and the, more, the morality that Black resistance is rooted in, it, it's almost as if there's been an ambivalence in how folks talk about Nat Turner's rebellion, right? It's, it's easier to place that rebellion on this one singular black man who might have been crazy, right? Then to think of him being a byproduct of a community and communities of resistance and rebellion. How did you come to terms and be comfortable with writing about what essentially some people will read as anti-white violence? Mm, mm. Well, I mean, they did murder women yeah, children right. i talk about an instance right. where they murder everybody and then remember there's an infant who was so young and right. didn't even have a name right. yet and, wasn't and christened then, yet and then, go, and then murder right, it and then um, go back right uh because was nobody gonna grow up to enslave right. them right. um and uh i will say that i think you know there's a sort of reticence to to jump into talking about violent resistance yep. um and i think it you know as a student the thing that gripped me about this story and the thing that drew me in about thinking like no 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 there's no way <laughs> that it was just like five dudes who came up <laughs> with this and then somehow tricked out like, the other 50 dudes into being a part of it um is the the empowerment of knowing that the no, 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 fighting back was an option. 
And it's an option that white people were very aware of mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because they create a whole legal system, a whole separate legal system to deal with it. Right. Um, and leaning into, you know, more 20th century philosophies of nonviolent, passive resistance, whatever, uh, really sort of leads into ideas of African Americans as, as really being subjugated by the slave right. regime, right? right. right. Um, when we have instance after instance after instance of people deciding, you know, knowing full well, this will most likely mean I'm going to die. Right. Um, but here is the point at which this is worth it. Um, yeah. And the voice of Black women is really interesting here because throughout the book, I also talk about Black women who look at the rebellion and mostly are angry at the loss, like loss of, of life, loss of their right. sons, loss of their families, the sale of their their children and kin um, out of the county. Um, and I think that that flip side is, is also really important because it's not this sort of like nonsensical violence. Where did this right. even come from? Right. Right. You know, people are also making decisions in the moment about the range of ways to participate with really high stakes, like really thinking about their survival and the survival of their community. Um, and, and I think we owe enslaved people that nuance. We owe enslaved people that humanity in our coverage of their lives that, you know, human beings you know, as human beings, that, that, that they both have the capability for this kind of violent pushback and the capability for really shrewd strategic moves, yeah. Yeah. even in the moment. Um, yeah. And I, I think we need to actually talk about violence and revolt more. Yeah. There's, a, there's sort of a, a myth that, oh, all those slave rebellions, all that stuff happened elsewhere, it happened in the Caribbean, it happened in South America, right. it, it happened somewhere else. And it, no, actually, I think just uh, the pr prevalence of it was heavily suppressed by right. a right. white regime that was interested in not admitting that enslaved people really did want to kill them most of the time. Um, no. No. You don't end the book with the rebellion, right? You really talk about the afterlife of the rebellion, surviving South Hampton. Uh, unpack that a little bit for our audience about, at least for you as a scholar, why it was important to tell that aftermath, right? But what that aftermath actually looked like, you know, particularly from the perspective of Black women survivors of, of what had happened prior. So one of the things that I opened the book with uh, comes from a WPA narrative of uh, a man named Alan Crawford, who mm -hmm. uh, was born after the rebellion happened, you know, was not uh, was not alive during the rebellion. Um, but one of the WPA, you know, questionnaire questions that all interviewers asked was about slave rebellion. They ask about right. slave rebellion. So in Virginia, Nat Turner comes up a lot because it is a he right. was a, a folk right. hero. He was somebody right. people had heard of. Um, but Crawford grew up right in the neighborhood where it happened. Uh, and he he talks about actually mostly about women uh so he talks about uh, a little bit about that turner traveling around but mostly he talks about an incident in a kitchen in southampton county that i cover in the book and talks about his grandmother uh who was enslaved on the edwards plantation and nat turner was brought through that plantation right. on his way right. to jail uh and so his family story about the rebellion is that his grandmother ran out when she <laughs> saw nat turner and hit him so hard that he bled <laughs> right. and said, yeah. how dare you take my son from me? Um, it's possible that his uncle Henry was the Henry who was at Cabin Pond right. with that Turner. Right. Um, right. That's a possibility. Uh, and so one of the things about that incident that struck me uh, was that A, here's a person who's mostly remembering other people's memories. Right. So he's remembering the story his family had to tell him about this rebellion. Right. Uh, and this woman, it's a very, you know, visceral, genuine moment of being really angry because her son is gone. Fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. And it's violent. Right. <laughs> it's violent. 
she smacked the mess out of him, right? Like, like the great slave rebel. Here's this woman. Um, and, you know, in previous iterations, uh, in earlier histories, A, this incident doesn't really show up. Um, and if right. it did, this woman might be cast, right, as a as a race traitor or someone who was in right. collusion right. with the right. white power right. structure. Right. But instead, you know, what I read is a woman who passed this story on to protect her grandson and who who's alive in 1930 to tell the tale well it's her right. descendant right right, right. right. And like right so so the ways that you know this family is warning about the dangers of getting involved with these kinds of it, it they're not wrong right that 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 will protect you to an extent uh not completely but to an extent right um so for me, it was the aftermath that really struck me that, you know, mostly it's men who were executed. There are about 18 right. executions um, and a number of men who were killed before capture um, right. or presumed dead before capture. Uh, and a number more, uh, I think it's like maybe 12, 12 who were um, transferred from the state, which just means sale to another region. <laughs> um in punishment for involvement but it's women who are left to pick up the pieces that the rebellion trials you know the aftermath of the rebellion is happening at harvest at cotton harvest which is yeah. a brutal time in the cotton agricultural cycle that these right. women are going through the rows and they feel these spaces and these empty spaces of missing men right and so i really play on a number of meanings for survivor it's a word we use for somebody who's endured something like a disaster right. of some kind right. right but it's also a word that we use for the bereaved that you know if you read a death announcement or you read an obituary, first, right we talk right. about people who are who, and there's no end date on that where you say right. oh you've made it to 10 years so you're no longer surviving your grandfather no right. you're you're never not surviving um and so i really wanted to think through what strategies were black people employing even as they're in the middle of the epicenter of power this courthouse in jerusalem which is now Cortland, in southampton county what what ways are they still trying to build out evasion and resistance yeah, yeah. when they're not supposed to be able to do that this is when they're supposed to be the most oppressed the most yeah, yeah. right it's you know executions are happening within eyesight of the courthouse um what are they doing to survive? Because there's still a black community in Southampton County. In fact, Nat Turner's descendants own the land he was once enslaved on. They're still Turners uh, who <laughs> who own land in Southampton, right? So thinking about this, right, as a county that's never not surviving, that this is still a very present and real piece of their of their lives, not just their past. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, uh, during the rebellion, at least one enslaved man's head was placed on a signpost. Um, after the remains decayed, they painted the signpost black, and blackhead signpost was a road marker for years. When the county got 911 service, they just named a road blackhead signpost. Black road. <laughs> right? After basically a decade of advocacy in this century, in February of 2021, finally the county changed the name of that road right so this isn't even a story that's like so yeah. far away that you know actually as the book was going to press they changed the name just in time for me to change the end of the book and say <laughs> no they actually they really changed did the right you know it's right. black activism that, that got the name changed to signpost road right um <laughs> so it's a street right blackhead signpost is a place that people have been driving with their children for right, centuries right, right? You know, right you're like this right, isn't some right. like distant like there's no right, more southampton history, county right. after right. the rebellion uh no there's still a southampton it's still there the roads are basically right. the same roads uh <laughs> um people still there with the last name turner and francis and waller and you know they do in science projects at the local high school together right like it's why it's wild right uh right, so you right. have to really I really wanted an accounting for that and an accounting for the ways that that black people black Southampton people continue to curate their own history um and keep their own history alive it's that surviving for me yeah. that was really important 
How critical was the WPA archive for you to do this work? And, and were there any things that you came across in the archive that dramatically shifted how you were thinking about this project as it was developing? So the thing about the WPA narratives, um, like all historical sources, they're fraught. Every single source is fraught. The court records that I looked at that are produced, you know, you know, produced by a white power structure, invested in making this like not such a big deal, uh, right? right? Um, those are fraught. Uh, Turner's jailhouse confession, fraught. Um, so there's no way to not deal with archival sources that there are a lot of voices involved in producing them. Um, I read through them. I just read through, you know, whatever, whatever I could find, especially paid attention to people who were either raised in Southside Virginia or were right. in Southside Virginia when they got interviewed. And then I went on my research trip, you know, I just, I went to the right. archive um, and I had the wonderful archival experience that we all sort of dream of where I sort of called in some boxes and special collections of the Library of Virginia for free Negro and slave records. And I, it had, I mean, there was description in the collection, but I wasn't mm -hmm. quite, you know, you're never quite sure. No, no you're what's actually in there. Gonna right. look right. And fine. And I found, you know, fragments of slave patrol receipts. I found, you know, there's, there's all these, you know, things, lists of free Negroes, which I, was what I expected to find and free people of color. And then I found a whole box of indenture papers. Wow. Um, and they overwhelmingly, they were f all for black people and they're overwhelmingly for, for black children, free children. And it was this dimension of the community that I, I hadn't quite, like I, I thought of because I'd read the WP narratives and obviously anybody alive in the 1930s to talk about slavery was probably a kid when they right, were right, enslaved right. or a teenager, young teenager. So I knew that I had been basically reading people's memories of their own childhood or their older kin who'd, who'd talk to them about things. Um, uh, and that none of the people really reasonably were alive in 1831. Uh, and it, it, it struck me as I was, I, I pulled out, I just started photographing because that's what you do in the archive. You're like, I got to photograph all of this and like figure out later what I've got here. Um, and I came across an indenture for a six month old person that these uh, ministers of the poor had deemed this baby's parents unfit and were indenturing them. Uh, I can't remember their gender. If they were a girl till she was 18, if they were a boy until he was 21. Um, and I, I photographed the whole box and then I put it away, <laughs> put it away. No. And I couldn't write that chapter in the dissertation version of this project. Um, right. I had a, and my goddaughter had just been born. Like I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. Um, and so I did not expect that I would write about black children in this book. Um, but as the more I looked at women's lives, the more I looked at the sources available, the more I realized that even if, you know, even if I hadn't thought that black children were going to be this fertile ground, that for black people, free and enslaved, black children represented, they were always thinking generationally, yeah. black children yeah. represented the future of slavery yeah. or the future of freedom, and that they were underfoot constantly and there was no way not to train them right. to resist and survive slavery. Um, and that, you know, it, t it honestly took me, it was like a three year process of like, okay, you got to go back to those and you need to go through these and figure out who they're being indentured to and think about where these free children are in the mix. And are they embedded in enslaved communities? Are they embedded in free communities? What's going on here? Um, that, that opened up like basically yet another geography of the county because children were used to run messages. They were used to get water. You know, they are also right. super mobile. Gathering intelligence, yes. <laughs> right. Um, and so then I ended up with a full chapter about the way children, actually a handful of children are actually convicted of being a part of this right. rebellion. Right. What's next for you, Professor Holden? Uh, so right now I've taken over the directorship of the Central Kentucky Slavery Initiative, uh, which, 
is an initiative to both tell the Black history of the University of Kentucky um, uh, from its origins well before 1865 uh, through the present day, um, but also to really dig into the significant and importance of slavery in central Kentucky. Um, it's been, <laughs> Kentucky makes a lot of cameo appearances in books about slavery uh, because it was such an epicenter for a hub for the internal right. slave trade, right. uh, the trade out of the Commonwealth. Um, right. But there hasn't been a synthetic work about Kentucky since the 1930s. I think the, the book is called like Old Slavery Times in Kentucky. Like that's what we're talking about here. Um, so really the goal here is to basically build build up a project that both brings students in to tell the history of their own institution and the history of their own state right. um, and to make sure that uh, through public projects uh, we make way more available particularly to descendant communities information about enslaved people so uh, you know right now uh, I'm working on a project about the history of bourbon. I'm working on a project <laughs> about the history of slave sales. I'm working on, you know, there's, there's a lot of irons in the fire yeah. that folks yeah. will be hearing about soon. Um, because pick an industry, there's no way to not touch slavery right. in right. the Commonwealth. Uh, horses, right. music, uh, bourbon, uh, hemp, um, tobacco. There's no way to not talk about enslaved people's contributions. This is Left to Black. We've been talking with Professor Vanessa M. Holden today. She's an associate professor of history in African American and Africana studies at the University of Kentucky, where she just mentioned she is director of the Central Kentucky Slavery Initiative. She is the author of Surviving Southampton African American Women and Resistance in Nat Turner's Community, which Erica Dunbar, Erica Armstrong Dunbar says is required required reading for anyone interested in the study of enslaved resistance. Thanks for joining us today, Professor Holden. Happy to be here. Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back. Black, 